this week on Core Talk. We're a team. And we pretty much have everything that every other organization has, and they don't realize that it takes a lot more than that to kind of make this all work here at Norfolk District. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We're a team of professionals, biologists, engineers, real estate and administrative specialists, lawyers, and many other specialties all working together to deliver engineering solutions that are vital to securing our nation, energizing our economy, and reducing disaster risks. Safely, on time, and within budget. This is Core Talk, the USAFE's Norfolk District podcast. From harbor port deepening and coastal storm risk management to environmental restoration and research and development, we exist to serve our community because we are a part of it. SAONs. 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 Let us try. Hello, everyone. It's your hosts, Major Tony Funkhauser and James Walker again, bringing you a new and slightly different episode of Core Talk. In this episode, we're going to be discussing recruitment. Essentially, why should someone want to work for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and specifically in Norfolk, Virginia? Today, our guests have very different backgrounds. They wear various hats. But the one thing that they have in common is that drive to satisfy the organization's recruitment needs while helping engineers or soon to be professionals in the fields of science, technology, engineering, or mathematics to establish a professional foothold before graduation. That being said, let's have everyone introduce themselves. Hello everyone, I'm Sharika Wanamaker. I'm the workforce coordinator here at the district. Hello everyone, I'm Tom Booth. I'm the deputy chief for engineering construction here at Norfolk District. So I know we focus a lot of uh, positions on STEM and our engineers, um, but we have a lot of other uh, positions that we have in the organization, just like yourself, Sharika, um, to help make the organization run. So if you could dive into the first topic, what positions and uh, specialties uh, in the core have routinely and consistently uh, aiming to bring on board? And then can you provide an overview of the district as a whole and how these positions work together to fulfill the mission? So, yeah, I think a lot of times people focus on engineers. You know, it's the first thing that they, they capture. And then the second part is, you know, Army. And so what we don't realize is, is that we're a team. And so one of our number one uh, professions that we're looking to fill here is contracting. You know, everything that we do with all the partnerships and, and going into uh, projects, we have to have contractors that help us um, to complete those those missions. We also have uh, resource management. We have uh, real estate folks here um, and a, a pretty robust uh, legal department. And so you're looking at having lawyers here and we have accountants and we have folks like myself that work in workforce and management analysts and, and human resources. And so we pretty much have everything that every other organization has. I think it's just the Army and engineers just kind of jumps out at them at first and they don't realize that it takes a lot more than that to kind of make this all um, work here at Norfolk District. So that being said, and Tom, I'll, I'll direct this question to you. Are there any particular skill levels, backgrounds, or special interests or criteria that those thinking about applying should possess before, well, before applying, or something that they should consider gaining experience in? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I do tend to focus on the engineering component by virtue of what uh, my responsibilities entail on the engineering construction side. Uh, but we generally look for all disciplines of engineers and architects to support our mission. Um, they generally need to have an ABET accredited degree uh, in engineering or architecture and have skills in modeling, design, uh, or even construction uh, interests. Um, I would like to point out too, one of the things we hear quite a bit in recruiting fairs is that individuals are surprised to hear they don't have to be in the Army to join the Corps of Engineers. Uh, we do have some green suitors in our midst, mostly in the leadership positions, but the large majority of our um, organizations are civilians, right? just like I am. Uh, so I'd like to point that out. And so we're always looking for motivated junior engineers and architects and experienced journeymen to um, join our ranks and those that have a drive or a desire uh, to join an organization with a mission, uh, a higher mission. I mean, here, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and it sounds quite military, so I could see how people could have that misunderstanding. Yeah, no, 100%. I know we do focus a lot on the diversity piece, too. I know, if, Sharika, if you wanted to kind of discuss that from the HR realm that we do just kind of focus on. Yeah, so... Um 
Just to add a little bit to what Tom was saying, so there are some soft skills that we're looking for too. Um, when it comes to working here, you're obviously going to be someone that's very organized. We've got you know project management skills um, that we're working for folks to have. Um, I also try to focus, especially when you know recruiting at these uh, fairs that I go to, looking at folks that care about our mission. That's you know um, you, you've got a mission where we're trying to help flood management. You know that's that's kind of impacting the world right now. And so when folks come and they kind of light up when you see them talk about helping their community with the projects that they do, you want those folks that are going to invest in Norfolk District. And so um, obviously it takes a diverse workforce to do that. And so, yeah, we go to the historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs. We're lucky to have um, three or four of them just in the area alone. We're 1.7 miles away from Norfolk University. We're 20, 30 minutes from Hampton University. We're an hour and a half from Virginia State University and the number one um, engineering program among HBCUs, North Carolina a and is about three, four hours away. And so we're pretty lucky to have those universities here to do that. And then we also participate in some federal um, uh, agencies and, and um, organizations that have diversity programs. So um, you're looking at going to the Black Engineer a Year um, conference coming up in the next two weeks. There's um, LULAC, which uh, focuses on Asian Pacific Islanders, um, American Indian. Um, there's so many different organizations that we try to pull from. And what, what we found, especially in like my field with workforce, is that when you bring a diverse workforce in, you actually have more ideas. And, and that idea can kind of drive probably the projects that we're doing here because some folks may see it all the same, but then when you have all those different ideas coming together, you may actually have a probably a, a, a better solution. And so that's what we're trying to get to here, you know? And so I try to drive home that we are helping the future. We've been hinting around a little bit, but I know like there are a lot of great things to do here at the, at the district, uh, even in the Corps of Engineers. So really, I just want to kind of ask you guys a question. There are, there are districts everywhere, right, across the United States, uh, even in, in Europe and, and Oconus. So why does, uh, you know, why are we um, so much more advantageous, um, you know, for someone that's in California where they got, you know, potentially San Francisco or one of the other districts that are closer by, why is it so advantageous for a biologist or an engineer or a project manager um, wherever they're at, to come here to the to the Norfolk district. I mean, okay, so you're comparing us to <laughs> California. <laughs> like, what do I say? I was going to start with saying, like, the water, but, I mean, whoa, how do I compare with that? But in all actuality, yeah, the water. I mean, I'm an East Coast girl, and so, yeah, I, I, I think that we kind of have a mix of everything, and it's a little bit closer to get to it. And so I've been over to California, and, yeah, it's great, but you got to drive six hours to get to L.A., but, you know, oh, by the way, it's probably going to take 12 hours of traffic. Um, and so so, I mean, honestly, we own our building. We're right here on the water. We've got all these great parks. There's so many different things. We're starting to kind of in like Norfolk, Virginia, we're revitalizing that whole area. And so you've got like kind of that old townish feel in Ghent. You've got um, the downtown Norfolk area. Then there's Virginia Beach that's kind of doing, you know, like the, the surfer kind of, you know, maybe the California vibe a little bit when you kind of go down there. And even you've got Norfolk Beach that's kind of doing something similar. And then I just love how close we are to other things like Williamsburg, D.C., New York City, and, and you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll admit it, I'm a Brooklyn girl. So, yeah, I, I like the idea that I can just drive six hours and I'm not still in the same state. <laughs> Let's throw that there. But, you know, we can also visit the South as well. And so Virginia is a very, uh, it's a mixed bag. And so I think it, it's, it's probably important to notice that, that you're coming here. It's not the country, as everyone likes to think it is, but you have some of everything, and you probably can't get bored as easily. It's, you're going to have to try to get bored here. The only thing I would say extra is the weather's great. I grew up in Florida where it's hot 10 months of the year. Here we've got great four seasons, and that's uh, conducive to being in outdoors, getting into winter sports, summer sports. Uh, you know, All the different seasons are here are awesome. So I have a question. And I'm going to direct this question towards you, Tom, first. What challenging experiences or competence building opportunities do professionals encounter when working at the core here in Norfolk District? 
especially in, in roles that relate to dredging and environmental regulation, how can these things help benefit the career of somebody who is just starting off as an engineer? Yeah, great question. Um, I'll say generally the challenges are, even though they're unique to the Hampton Roads area or the areas that we're focusing on, um, they're similar everywhere else, uh, especially in coastal regions. Um, and one of the benefits of working for the Corps of Engineers is that we can leverage that in entire enterprise, right? Mm -hmm. So we collaborate with a lot of our partner districts uh, that are in similar situations. We set up mentor um, relationships with some of our junior engineers and architects to work with lo other local districts so they can gain that experience. You know, for ex example, uh, you know, the hurricane recovery that was in Katrina several years ago, we're benefiting from that now as we work through some of our Norfolk CSRM programs. Um, we're also assisting, as you know, Jacksonville District in the Florida area and New York in the New York area as well. So there's a lot of opportunities for engineers and, and architects to collaborate with other um, senior architects and engineers outside of our district to gain those experiences and set them up for future opportunities um, as they move through their career path. Given the historical focus on flood control, navigation, and national defense, has the Corps evolved its recruiting strategies over time to align with the current needs and priorities? Yeah, I would say there's twofold. Um, one of the most important things that we've been provided here recently is a direct hire authority. So where in the past we've had to traditionally go through USA Jobs and do those announcements uh, and seek out candidates that way, now we have a direct path to bring on qualified individuals that are able to help us with our mission. Okay. Um, and we can go out and recruit them Folks are able to reach out to us direct and ask about opportunities. And if we have something, uh, we can talk and bring them directly on, or even potentially redirect them to another sister district that might have an opportunity that's more well suited for them. So DHA has been great for us. Uh, we've you know, brought on a lot of talent um, directly using that uh, authority. I also say that we've evolved the disciplines that we're looking for. So in the past, where we've made, in Norfolk District specifically, where we've really focused on military construction. Over the past several years, with many of the BRACs, the base realignments, um, now we're transitioning our program to very heavy civil works. So where we're looking for maybe a little bit lesser of the architects and the vertical disciplines like structural and MEP, we're looking more now for civil hydraulics engineers with a coastal focus um, and disciplines like that, which a lot of folks seem to be interested in now. So we're targeting those type of disciplines that are supporting the program that we have at hand currently. So for an engineer who's currently in university who has dreamt for the last four or five years of their study to really exercise, you know, the architectural aspect of, of being an engineer, should they let the current recruiting priorities deter them from applying? Oh, absolutely not. No, I mean, even though the Civil Works mission is primarily horizontal, um, there is still a lot of components of the structural architecture disciplines that we bring into that. Um, it's just much more heavily civil and, and horizontal focused. So there's lots of opportunities, and that doesn't mean that military construction is going away, right? So we do have that vertical uh, program requirement still that we're still looking to recruit and build the bench for the, the future of our, um, our organization. Let me jump in there real quick. So a couple of things, when we talk about like hurricane and, and beach erosion projects and uh, protection and stuff like that, it's important to notice that we have, or to mention that we have an emergency management section here. Mm -hmm. And so when I've went to a lot of these recent recruitment fairs, they are in love with that idea. They're in love with the idea that they are able to come here, be an engineer, and then something happens across the country or across the world. And that, and not at first, of course, you want them to get to know their job, but at some point they can join the CAT team, um, the crisis action team, and then jump in there and help people. And so that's some of the mission that I drive there because recruitment also is about understanding your competitor. So we are competing against private sector. And so how do we take someone that can go to private sector and maybe make a little bit more money? And so we have to kind of sell those type of things. Well, can you do this over there? And then um, as far as looking at the historical focus and flood control and everything there, um, what we're doing this past year to align that is, and I, I love that we focus on that, there's five generations that currently work and are in the workforce right now. And so understanding the different generations that we're trying to bring in is important. And then when going to these recruitment fairs, this younger generation, they're like 
into social justice and social reform and environmental concerns mean something. And so when going there and talking about flooding in Norfolk, they understand that. They understand that something has to be done to combat flooding. They understand that not only at the Corps of Engineers are they going to be doing engineering projects, but there's an opportunity to look at oyster restoration and how it filters the water in the harbor and, and starts to build back the environment around it. And so that's kind of how I'm selling them on that stuff, is that flooding is happening all over. What are we doing about it? Well, come over here and let's work on that. And oh, by the way, you can help filter you know, the water with the oyster restoration, or you can do all these different things, or you can join the emergency management team who is always recruiting for people. So um, if I had to add anything to those two questions. That was good. And I, I know you, mm-hmm. you highlighted the private sector being our main competition. And I know that's, uh, you know, Richard Klein talked about that as well when we were uh, interviewing him last time in the podcast. But you'll see, like, I think the... I think we're okay if, if younger generation wants to go into the private sector first and then come to you, say, it's like we're also looking at those opportunities. Um, I know that the journeymen are, are a big focus for us right now. I don't know if you want to address a little bit, Tom, but I think understanding, like, we're not just looking for folks coming right out of college. We're looking for folks at, at any point of life, um, as long as they fit the team and they got the skill sets, that's what we want to bring on to the organization because know that we know that they're going to make us better. I know that's kind of a focus area that we've been looking at recently. So those coming from private sector bring a lot of experience that'll uh, benefit our program as well. But what they also find that is that while the pay may be not quite what they see in private sector, the work-life balance, uh, the benefits that we offer uh, quickly offset that, right? And we find that they're uh, very happy when they come on board. Um, And the mission that we have, right? We touched on that earlier. Um, No matter the program, you're impacting the community, the service members or their families. So the mission that we have kind of gives folks a, a, you know, a calling and a, a little bit more job accomplishment satisfaction, uh, if you will. That makes a lot of sense. Actually, the first person that comes to my mind when I think about um, somebody who transitioned from the civilian sector, or from the commercial sector, rather, um, is Drew Gebler. And he was on our first episode, remember? Um, and yeah, you can tell in, with, in the passion in his voice that he really does enjoy being here. I have another question, because you, were, you, were, you mentioned that the issues and the problem solving that's going on here at UCA Small Folk District, these problems are, are, are similar to problems in other regions as well. But is there anything that Norfolk District is leading the way on in such a way that that experience could only get, not, not that it could only be acquired here or obtained here, but it would be obtained here in a very special way, in a very particular way? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can think of a couple of different examples. Um, one of which is our DODEA program. Uh, that's the DOD education activity. So we have the design center and we run all of the designs for replacing their schools, K through 12 schools that our service members kids go to. And you don't often think about the government leading innovation, uh, but this is one case where we did. Uh, so we developed the new education um, layout for their schools um, based on the kind of current education paradigm for student focused education versus teacher-focused education that we saw many decades ago. And after we developed that, other private public sector, state and local agencies that run their schools followed suit. And then on the civil work side too, we're looking at natural nature-based features that had never been used before for our local Norfolk project, as well as some of the projects we're involved with in Florida and soon to be in Virginia Beach and Portsmouth as well. So uh, individuals working here have opportunities to develop new solutions that have never been used elsewhere and then bring that experience potentially to other organizations uh, throughout the country and the world uh, in the uh, progress through their career path. Sharika, could you share some of the incentives and benefits that the Corps offers to professionals considering joining our team? Are there specific programs or internships tailored for individuals with STEM backgrounds and or are there mentorship programs? So, yeah, we do currently. So um, I want to say this fiscal year, we have um, nine million dollars across the Army to use for recruitment. And so that can be relocation, student loan repayment for coming into the federal government. We can offer all of that to anyone wanting to come into the Corps of Engineers as a whole. And so we are offering our hiring managers 
this pot of money that they can then go and take that money and offer it to help build our team. As far as specific programs, um, there is one that's near and dear to me. It's Advancing Minority Interest in Engineering, the AMI program, which is directed towards historically black colleges, um, American Indian um, and diversity universities, um, bringing them in on a 10-week um, internship. We also have the student internship program, which is through and funded with ACMA, and so ACMA is the Army Civilian um, uh, Agency. And what they do is, is they're like managing all of the career fields. And so they've been, over the course of their transition, looking at how can we build the career field and build each career field to get proper training, get um, opportunities for getting your degree, they look at um, opportunities to help um, build skill sets, and um, they push that out to all of their Army organizations, and we can take advantage of that at entry and also afterwards. And so um, that's kind of interesting, too. We also have the Army Fellows Program, where after you graduate from college, you can then take advantage of working with an Army organization and then... Um, mentorship programs that's kind of internal but there are some higher mentorship and coaching opportunities with the army coaching network and so you can actually join that network and then get an army coach you can also um, participate in our mentorship programs internally um, as well as like various leadership development programs i think part of what keeps me employed is having this great mission of, of one, bringing in our folks and also figuring out how to keep them trained um, and keep their skills there and keep the, the district uh, diverse. So, so I, I, you just highlighted a lot of awesome resources for recruiting at the college level. Um, I know that we're working towards the uh, military career skill bridge program as well. Can you highlight a little bit that, for, especially for the military folks that are transitioning out and looking for jobs, there's another opportunity potentially for that for them to come here. Yeah. Um, so the DoD skill bridge program basically state, says that if you are retiring or separating from the military, and so any of it, so Coast Guard. Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, Space Force, you can come over, I guess you're authorized to uh, go to an organization for 180 days. And so we are in the process of bringing the DOD Skill, Skill Bridge program to this district. And so we will be recruiting at the Fort Eustis or Joint, Fa Joint Force Langley Eustis. Um, the Navy bases, we're going to Wounded Warriors at Quantico in March. Um, you'll have opportunities to join our organization by going to any one of those events. Also, by taking advantage of contacting us directly. We also use uh, what's called TARP Yellow. It's a platform where you can go in there and upload your resume, and then all of you states and all of our organizations can look at you. But yeah, we're always wow. looking for military. And I think, you know, Sitting here in our great podcast, I mean, two of us were, you know, transitioned off of active duties with UJ and myself. So, definitely, we were definitely love to have anyone with that military background. I know Tom transitioned too, so all everyone here has got some military background. So we're it's it's definitely a a organization, a culture that continues to to give back to the community. It's that calling. Are there specific programs in place to nurture and enhance the skills of engineers, scientists, and lawyers, et cetera? So we have four. Um, levels of what's called the leadership development program. So the leadership development program here at our district one and two, um, LDP one focuses on leading self, LDP two focuses on leading others, LDP three is done at our division headquarters at Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn, New York. And then LDP four is done um, by our USACE headquarters in Northern Virginia. And so as you grow, you, you go into each phase. And so, um, and we invest a lot of, I think it's important to note, we invest a lot of resources into these programs. They're not just a program that we like patched together. I mean, we, we truly built a, a, a program at each level that every program, one through four, you're doing something different. 
Um, I want to say at the three and four level, there may be some rotations. There's some um, fellowship opportunities and some shadowing opportunities to do. We have a local shadowing program here where you can shadow our, our executive staff. Um, there's, there's also opportunities. I want to say we're bringing cadets here this summer. And so um, we're always focusing on career development. We're always focusing on how can we be, you know, be better. And also that um, ACMA organization, that's their primary focus is career development is that each field has to continue to grow. That's how we're going to be the best force. And so they're always pushing career development opportunities. And so we just have to have folks that want to continue to nurture and enhance their skills like to talk on the technical side of that as well. So we do have a pretty robust technical continuing education program where we try to offer at least one, if not multiple training opportunities for uh, individuals over the course of the year. As we all know, USACE has the USACE Learning Center that has very USACE specific training uh, classes. You know, it could be anything from dam and levee safety to concrete fundamentals. We also have opportunities with non-USACE training uh, through private entities that might be in any realm of uh, interest for employees. We also encourage employees to pursue credentials that are relevant to their position too. So as you know, many of us have our pro professional engineering license. We have many registered architects, financial management uh, certified folks across the gamut of all the responsibilities that we have. So. There's lots of opportunities for individuals to continue growing, learning, um, and, and refining their skills to set them up for upward mobility. I'd like to go back real quick to the, to the initial incentives, too. A lot of folks don't realize uh, most of our professional series positions are two-step career ladders. So what that means is, is well, you may come in as a GS5, 7, or a 9, in a professional series, which is most of our engineering, architecture, many of our resource and finance management, um, project management positions, it's a two-step ladder. So you will come in as, say, for example, a GS7, but instead of going to an 8 non-competitively, the next year you go to a 9, and then you go to an 11, up to a 12. So it quickly, while you may come in in a little bit less than what the private sector is, um, you quickly advance that salary in your, you know, your realm of responsibility as you progress over the, uh, the career ladder. I think the other things that we do kind of unique to the district is that we're doing the supervisor workshop um, here uh, in the next month. Um, that's kind of bringing all of our supervisors to continue to develop them because we know how important it is to continue to grow our, our, our supervisors in the organization. Uh, I think the other part of that, too, is um, our executive mentorship program that we just started. Um, uh, our strategist, Jimmy Harkett, is kind of spearheading that for the organization, okay. uh, where if you want to see what the executive level is doing, um, we're, we're showing our calendars to everybody. And if you want to attend events and kind of see behind the curtain of what we're doing at our level to um, help support the organization, like please shoot an, a, an email or a note to uh, Jamika and we'll get you on the, on the list and you can kind of see what's out there and you can attend and listen into all the, these higher level events um, just to get a feel for all the things that you're doing at, at your level. Um, is impacting and helping supporting the decisions that we're making at our level. Kind of looking at some of the opportunities that we have for folks that are in, in college right now. Um, what opportunities do we have to help kind of expose them to the core of engineers prior to that might help support their decision making? Sure, yeah. So we collaborate with local universities, especially in the Commonwealth and uh, other districts do with their local universities. Specifically, we work with uh, UVA, uh, just completed their winter externship, had three individuals, architects here for uh, a week um, working with our, our um, organization. We collaborate with tech and a lot of the other universities in the area. Uh, so there's opportunities for them to get uh, exposure. I would say get involved in your local SAMI. Um, organizations, and that's a great way to uh, meet and understand our mission and develop opportunities not only with us but other organizations as well. And that goes for outside of universities as well. So even just by virtue of our mission, there's lots of opportunities where we um, collaborate with local and state agencies, other federal agencies, in that that creates a lot of collaboration, exchange of information, and obviously opens up avenues for opportunities in, in career path development. So speaking of recently to some personnel who have worked for the Corps for 30 plus years, in some cases even 45 years, such as Richard Klein, we've had him on a recent episode, it has been stressed that not every person that walks through the USA Norfolk District doors actually is still working on the same types of projects and tasks several years down the road. Some people 
stay in environmental restoration, some on military construction, as you've mentioned, some end up in regulatory and planning, and they're doing, or they're doing project management. So considering all of this, what career broadening opportunities are available for engineers within the Corps, and how does that contribute to their professional development? There's a lot of different opportunities. Uh, we have developmental opportunities within Norfolk District specifically uh, that we kind of highlight. In the course of a, a individual's developing their own career path and aspirations, they'll, they'll work with their supervisor to develop what we call an individual developmental plan. Uh, and then when we try to marry those up with opportunities in the education that will set them up for success. So specifically with the Norfolk District, we'll create opportunities for where maybe engineers go work in project management, or project management works in construction, or a budget analyst can go work in resource management uh, to let them experience something outside of their realm of responsibility, but also set them up for possibilities in, in the future. And that not only happens within Norfolk District, but also USACE wide. So you'll, there's a lot of 120-day opportunities that we call them um, to go work sometimes in person at a local, dist, uh, another geographic district, or even potentially remotely as well. So question that pertains particularly to the engineer field, and forgive my 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 ignorance here. You know how some professions, if you do not establish your your specialty early on, and and if you find yourself balancing around that, that's a negative. It negatively impacts you in your career. Is that the case for an engineer? Can you work in different, can you move back and forth between different sections and that's actually advantageous for you? Yeah, so it's easier earlier on in your career. Uh, generally, if you pick a specific discipline, say structural, you're gonna work in structural, but you can get exposure to design, to construction management, um, horizontal construction, vertical construction. So it's a little easier to transition and get that experience early on versus when you become a journeyman. So we're looking for specialized folks later on in their career, but getting that broadening experience early sets you up for long-term career development in terms of going into management uh, positions and leadership positions further down the road, but absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Shriek, I don't know if you want to highlight a little bit. I know the deputies uh, of the district have been working towards developing some of these developmental positions, and how do we kind of provide more exposure and broadening for our folks in the organization, if you want to just kind of highlight some of the things we're working on? Yeah, so we offer the opportunity that um, you can rotate to different sections. You can um, have the opportunity to see what the other specialties are working on by being exposed to different projects. We even offer the opportunity to go um, and, and shadow folks in leadership positions and management, um, which also kind of gives some mentorship and and some um, exposure to how a, a complete project kind of comes together. Because if you kind of stay in one area, you really kind of see it through to kind of a, a certain point, but then you don't know what happens after or around that. So it's also like, for me, I think of it as like a full process exposure. And so we're, we're allowing them to develop by looking at how things may go from start to finish, how things may go in the other realm, such as like regulatory, which may be kind of different in a sense than the traditional engineer. Um, but also um, we had someone that recently went from working as a construction control rep or and, and they can go somewhere that's less technical. Or even going, um, we had someone else that went and served as a, stra a district strategist. And that was an opportunity that was completely different than what they do on a day-to-day. -day. But it was so important because the exposure there and working as a district strategist, they got to collaborate on so many different things and offsites and visits and um, you know, mingling with generals and you know, you know, and, and and city council folks and and so if if anything from what we get from that question, I would say to always try to develop, and and those that have went on developmental opportunities encourage you to continue to do that. And I, I it's important to note that our, our senior folks here, um, when we look at them, our executive staff specifically, and some of our deputies, they have all taken advantage of a leadership program. They have all had a mentor and, 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 and or are mentors, and they all have done developmental assignments for the most part. And so if you're looking to continue and broaden yourself, you're going to have to kind of stretch out and do those different things. Can you walk us through the recruitment process a little bit? Just so if people that are trying to apply here, they understand what, they're, uh, what they need to do to become part of the Norfolk District? 
Yeah, so there are multiple ways to get into the federal government. And so the first way, of course, is go on to USA Jobs, and then you can apply for a position um, via the site. From there, um, they'll get reviewed, interview process, just kind of keep in mind that there's a longer time frame for that. We also have what's called direct hiring authority where you can um, apply with your resume, and in most cases, to a position, and then we can use direct hire authority to just bring you on. Um, and so we just encourage you to, one, send um, an email straight to us, it's on our site, um, apply for the position, and then just always be looking for opportunities that way because there's multiple ways to hire and just pay attention to how we can bring you in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that was a great point. And I think from a lot of our recent recruits too, the feedback that we're getting is that we think that Norfolk is a great place to work and they agree. You know, and they come on board and they think we have a great organization, um, great culture here. So look forward to hearing from some new uh, interest and uh, we'll talk about opportunities. And again, we've touched on this in, in most of the episodes that we've done so far, but so many of the people who work here are working here 10, 20, 30, and even 40 plus years. So I think that that says something about the work environment here as far as how healthy it is to work here and also how fulfilling it is to work here as well. I think it's important to note that we are a Department of the Army civilian enterprise. And so we are trying to be on the forefront of advancement. And so I think what a lot of folks like about coming here is that, yes, they have a fulfillment with mission, but we're also um, accepting of, of hybrid. You know, I think we've, we've, we're, we're very um, open to that. We've got a few remote opportunities, but obviously engineers are going to work with, you know, have to come in from time to time. But we, we definitely aren't trying to just um, do things the same. We are, are trying to advance and we're okay with moving forward and being on the forefront of that and saying this is how it works well and we're gonna continue to grow as an organization. And so that's some of the things that I, I try to talk to the folks coming into our organization about is, is that we're not you know, the standard organization. We are different and uh, you know, we're small but mighty. All right, thank you guys both for being here. Thank you for everything that you guys do to try to bring some of the sharpest minds in various fields to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Norfolk District to help facilitate our ability to support the Commonwealth of Virginia and Hampton Roads. For our audience, yes, that's you guys in your cars, you guys at home, you guys on your lunch breaks. Thanks for joining us for yet another episode of Core Talk. Please remember to like, share, subscribe, and follow. Feel free to comment and message us about topics that you would like to hear in upcoming episodes. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. guys. Thanks, James.